Stone evolutions, they're kind of hit or miss, they're pretty interesting. Sometimes you get high tier runs with things like Starmie, Polyrath, and other times you're in store for a little bit of a struggle with things like Executor and Raichu. The problems that you'll face with these Pokemon pretty much comes from the fact that you generally learn nothing via level up, and there's some few exceptions, and these runs pretty much exclusively rely on TMs and HMs to have a solid run. Today we'll be doing a solo run with Ninetales, and I didn't really have much hope for this run going into it. Now if you look at the stats, there are two things that jump out. It has a really nice special and speed stat of 100, and the rest of the stats are really solid as well. The problems are going to start with what we just talked about, the extremely shallow level up learn set, and mainly the fact that Flamethrower isn't a TM in Generation 1 for some reason. That means you're just missing out on pretty much the best fire move in the game. In the Vulpix run that I did a long time ago, it got notable things like Confuse Ray that really helped get past tough challenges both early and late, and it got flamethrower we just talked about that here's what we're actually gonna work with at the start and it's not much but like I just mentioned this is pretty typical for stone evolutions ember it's a really solid move to start off to have early in Kanto quick attack can also just finish off opponents it can also help coverage for things that resist fire then you have tail whip it kind of works in tandem with quick attack when you need it and roar it's absolute garbage in gen 1 and it serves absolutely no purpose all hope is not lost when you look at the TM learn set you do get notable things things like Body Slam and Dig, those can be really helpful. And then the only real fire move that you're going to have access to that's going to do any significant damage is Fire Blast. It's going to be a little bit later before we get it, but it has really high base damage. But the accuracy, eh, 85% accuracy in Gen 1 feels like about 50%, but it is what it is. Overall, a fire type in Kanto, they usually struggle. There's several spots in the game that are pretty rough. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, going into this one, I fully expected like a four hour top run. A pretty mid-level run, maybe something similar to how Marowak was that didn't have an answer for Gyarados, but we'll never know until we do the run, so I think it's about time we just dive in. But before we begin, I'd like to just quickly say that if you want to help the channel grow, likes and comments really help the most here. If you're someone new, maybe someone who just doesn't really think about that sort of thing, or maybe if you're a returning subscriber, like Gutherford007, I would like you just to scroll down and tell me why you think that Generation 1 didn't have a flame thrower TM even though the equivalent moves like surf, ice beam, psychic, all those had TMs in there so I don't know why I don't get it. It's one of the huge things I think that's missing from generation one and I'd like to know your guys thoughts on it and with that out of the way I think you can just grab yourself a sodi pop and let's just kind of kick this one off and you can see from this first rival battle uh, we have 19.53% chance to crit that's pretty good and here's where we're going to get our first taste of something that resists ember now here like we talked about earlier tail whip with quick attack and get you through this one pretty quick and overall since there's no water moves on the other side of the table yet we can get through this one fairly quick i do think you could go straight to brock and have a pretty decent time but you do need some levels looking ahead so i do battle all of the bug catchers in viridian forest and i don't show it here but you have to battle about two or three depending on your luck wild battles you want to get around 80 experience here and it's going to help in a couple of locations now the first thing just a little bit of that experience goes to helping you hit level nine after this final bug catcher and when that's done we can just go straight into Brock. And overall, this fight is pretty simple. You just go straight Ember on the Geodude. Now, Geodude, Tackle is not preferred. You would love it to use Defense Curl since you're using a special move. And here I actually get really unlucky. It goes for Tackle a lot, and I take quite a significant amount of damage, and I thought I was going to be in trouble here, but when we take it out, you get to the key thing that helps Vulpix out the most. That's its high speed. That means we do outspeed the Onyx, and since we have Tail Whip, we can control its bad damage. We just kind of keep it slow and steady here. Here. hope that it doesn't crit on a tackle or something crazy like that and even though we get hit at the very end and we go all the way down to 2 HP I still am able to come out of this battle with the first badge no resets we can move on the next segment including Mount Moon is made pretty easy with Ember there are a few things to note here and that's the fact that I pick up four total extra battles the first one is the bug catcher on route 3 that you just watched and the rest are all in Mount Moon I pick up the usual candidates 
there's a super nerd who's very experience rich, there's a bug catcher near him, then there's the double grass lass, and since we do have a special move today, we're going to be taking out the hiker as well. This is very important. Combined with the extra experience that we got earlier, it ensures that we'll hit level 18 when we finish up here heading towards Cerulean. And I talk about damage rounding a lot, but hitting level 18 for that damage rounding threshold really helps when you look ahead to rival number 2. The main thing about this battle is that unless you crit the Pidgeotto, it's going to be a 3 hit KO with Ember, and just like old times, we are met with a sand attack pretty much immediately. This is really annoying because it kind of puts a wrench in our plans because PP management on Nugget Bridge was tight enough as it was. I'm fully preparing for a reset here as I get lower and lower and I start to miss attacks, but somehow at the very end of the fight, I survive at just 4 HP and Ninetales, it clutches it out and we stay resetless for now. After that, Nugget Bridge, it's not the most interesting section of the game. It does contain the highest cluster of mandatory battles, but notice that I do take a risk here. I use my surplus of potions rather than return to the center, but since I got sand attacked in the fight, it was going to be really close. And there's no extra battles here, and when I get to the end, I barely skim by by the skin of my teeth, and when we're done with that, we can start thinking ahead. And at first, you might be thinking, hey, you're going to skip Misty. That's kind of a no-brainer because most runs that are weak to her have to, but I have other plans today. Ninetales, it doesn't learn pretty much any move, but Dig is our ace in the hole here, and it's going to save us a ton of time if we can go ahead and get through Misty now. And I'm going to say that this is kind of the turning point where I started to see some potential in Ninetales, especially when I was first practicing this run. Now with high base special and speed, it really does make this run kind of interesting. As for the Star You, I outspeed it. It's a guaranteed one shot here. But as for the Star Me, you might be surprised that I also outspeed it as well. This means that we have a real fighting chance here. Now it starts off solid, but we do get hit with a water gun crit, but at least it wasn't a bubble beam. Now I dig underground and once again, in the clutch when all the chips are pushed into the middle of the table the high crit rate comes into play and I grasp another victory in a close situation now this one overall was just really impressive to me now mainly because Ninetales it just doesn't have much to work with and going into the run I thought for sure that we would have to backtrack but this little Firefox it just has great stats where it matters the most down in the SSN just like with Dig Ninetales is very fortunate that it gets some of these really powerful early game moves like body slam. The only other thing to do here is to grab the rare candy guarded by the gentleman. We're not going to show that. Let's just take a look at rival number three. And here, the Pidgeotto just kind of puts itself into a checkmate. It uses quick attack, which means that I'm going to get two free turns anyway. But here, body slam, it just crits and it makes the process quicker. And with body slam in hand and no sand attacks this time, this one is just pretty quick overall. And speaking of quick, I do have dig. I'm very fast and Lieutenant Surge is weak to to ground. Now I guess the only thing to note is that you don't really need dig for Pikachu. You can just save a turn by using body slam, but we can just keep pressing on. Now we can just skip over rock tunnel. Let's go straight to Celadon. And the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to pick up the two PP ups and then we're going to take on the rocket hideout. The funny thing about this run is that the key to all of it is here in the rocket hideout. And that's just something you don't really hear ever. Double edge is absolutely clutch in this run, but it's not going to come into play until the very end and then we'll just go into some detail about it then. There's also an additional hidden nugget here. It's just kind of a nice bonus to pick up since we're here anyway. The only thing to really talk about here is yet another clutch victory for Ninetales. Now we don't talk about Giovanni number one often and if we are you know it's kind of trouble. Now here I'm a bit overconfident. I don't heal up. Now my first mistake was not going dig on the Onyx and it crits on a super effective rock move. Now the second unfortunate string of luck is that I barely miss knocking out this Rhyhorn and I take even more damage and I'm in a really bad spot going into the Kangaskhan. Here only one thing can save us and this battle is brought to you by Guard Spec by Silco and the fact that Rage is an awful move. These two things add up to us surviving on just one HP and Ninetales it's kind of proving that it has nine lives as we progress through this run. Next up we have some unfortunate technical difficulties. I was able to get back 
all of this recording, but unfortunately I made a blunder just due to life and stuff. Sometimes you have to pause the recording and sometimes unfortunately it happens to where your game and your recording software get out of sync. And I guess I didn't unpause the recording, but I continued to play the game and I didn't realize it till after the next segment. Now all we miss here, very fortunate, all we miss here is me picking up Fly, taking out the very trivial rival number four fight in Pokemon Tower, and we have Dig, so the ghost types wasn't that bad. I did want to talk about item management here in this run because when I got the Poke Flute, I was at exactly 20 items, and I just wanted to emphasize how tight uh, item management was in this run. But thankfully, we do have the rest of the footage on track, and let's just kind of skip ahead to that. You can see here on the screen that it's still kind of paused, and it's just one of those things. And if you're that one guy who gets upset that I skipped some rival battles, you might want to avert your eyes because we will not be seeing rival number four here today, mainly just because of my own mistakes. As far as inventory goes, things are going to stay tight coming up as well because you got to think we're holding on to several additional items that other runs don't have to worry about. We still have things like PP ups for fire blasts in the future. We're hanging on to double edge. That's taking up space. And now we're going to fill up our bags in the safari zone and we're going to do some extra additional stuff down there that other runs don't do either. Here is where I would like to talk about some of the problems with the run. Now, so far you're watching the video, we've navigated this early game and things are looking way Way better than I ever thought they would for this run but there is an elephant in the room or rather I probably should say there's a 10 foot blue serpent in the room we do not have an answer for Gyarados and keep in mind that this is the optimized run from here on out every little decision that we make is mainly going to be influenced by getting past that fight in the most efficient way possible we'll go in more depth when we get there and how some trial and error kind of took me to that point but just just know that after practicing this run, doing it several times, it was the shadow that was hanging over the entire run. And it's not really a surprise because it's just how it always goes when you're weak to Gyarados and you just don't have an answer for it. Now, overall, things are standard here. I do pick up the Carbos, but since we have such good speed, I'm just going to be picking it up to sell so we can splurge just a little bit more in the Celadon Mart. When I wrap up there, I'm at exactly 19 spots in my inventory, and since we are a fire type erica's gym it just provides a great opportunity for some easy experience and more importantly some easy money now i brought up gyarados just now and this is where some of the extra battles start to creep in there are five out of these seven trainers in this gym that are just really great experience for how quick the battles are i do them all and then we're going to proceed to erica this fight is free but you can be put to sleep it can just really waste a lot of time from what i've seen now here i get poisoned early and and honestly, that's kind of a good thing. This means that I can now not be put to sleep, and since I outspeed, I can just easily mow down this fight. And with this extra money and the TM for Mega Drain, I think it's time we go shop. Now, outside of the usual stuff, I'm picking up a Great Ball here, as well as the TM for Reflect. When I dump my inventory and I get things under control, I'm able to afford five calciums and four proteins total, and that's gonna be a huge help. And now that I have space, I do go down and buy a Pokedoll for Mimic in the future, and we can just be on our way after that. There's one more quick stop left in the run, and now it's time to head down to old Uncle Koga. I do have Dig, and this one, it's still a little annoying. Now, Dig just can't one shot the coughings and that means that I'm kind of opened up to smoke screens and then Muck can survive enough to use minimize a little bit. Now the second coughing hits me with a smoke screen and I do start to miss on the wheezing. Now here I'm just kind of hoping that it goes for self-destruct while I'm underground with Dig but near the end I do get hit by a self-destruct and for another time in the run I survive in the red health and Ninetales says not today to the god of death. Next up I do pick up the good rod and and I catch me a surf user. I talk about this some, but I just love that you pick up strategies from doing other runs. And just like we did with the Marowak run, I'm gonna be doing four optional battles inside of Pokemon Mansion, but we're not done there. There's a ton of trainers in Blaine's gym, and I'm gonna be wiping out every single one of them in preparation for that late game Water Snake. And now we can just snag another badge after staying loyal to Tombstoner, brother. 
In this spot, it's insignificant. I have Dig, his Pokemon don't even have good AI, and I'm in really no danger of losing, and I actually fumble a couple of moves here, and I start to take some damage, but that's not really important. The important thing here is Fire Blast. Now, I've already said this, it's not the best move I think Flamethrower is, and it's mainly because of that 85% accuracy, but 180 effective power with Stab, guys, it's enough to murder things that resist fire. Now, originally, I was going all in on Special, and I was using this move as my Gyarados killer, but I kind of got away from that strategy, but that's kind of a story for later in the video. I do have three PP ups here, but since I had to learn Fire Blast in the third slot, that means that it would be horribly inefficient to use the PP ups now, so I do hold off. And after that, we can go to our favorite place, the Fighting Dojo. I waited until the last fight to use the PP ups because I have put Fire Blast into the first move slot. This means the PP ups are pretty much just a matter of pressing A, it's just over off faster and you already know we get offered one of the dojo's very special and rare pokemon as a trophy but you guys i think you know how i feel about that shut up bitch Next up is Sylph, and originally I was doing a ton of extra battles here, but optimizations, they're just very satisfying to me, because here I was able to cut out every single optional battle outside of the one that leads to the rare candy on the 10th floor, and I would argue that that's a mandatory battle. Getting that rare candy is usually important. There's a Carbos, there's Earthquake, but that's neither here nor there. But outside of picking up the protein on the 5th floor, it is straight to rival number 5. And here in my testing, and even when I started to look at the damage numbers later, this is where I kind of got blinded for my love of Fire Blast. I sort of honed in on it and I got that tunnel vision and it's pretty easy to see why. Now if it connects, it just does so much damage. Now you're not going to see it here because I'm trying to preserve some uses, but it does extreme damage even on Alakazam and Blastoise. Now overall, we don't have to go into any more detail about this fight, but Ninetales, in this fight specifically, it's one of the toughest battles in the game usually. It's just performing really well. It's performing at a much higher level than I had anticipated originally. When Sylph is done, I do pick up the TM for Mimic, and I do make a mistake here. Now it's minor, but I did skip healing, but I actually forgot that I needed Fire Blast for Sabrina, so I do have to use an Elixir here, but it's really not a big deal. But I do make yet another mistake on Sabrina that could have been costly. Now the order here is to go Body Slam, two Fire Blast, and then close out with Body Slam on the Alakazam. Now I go for Body Slams here, and on the Venomoth, I I thought I was going to get paralyzed because I made the mistake of going for the wrong move, but I did get really lucky. I got a fully paralyzed proc and that allowed me to still outspeed the Alakazam and ultimately it allowed us to outspeed it and get another badge. It was just kind of like a little mistake. It could have been costly. It could have easily been a reset, but we got a little fortunate here. As far as Giovanni goes, the training picks up once again. Now I need just a little bit more experience and these battles are high enough level and easy enough. I battle all but one of the these trainers to get my experience where I need it to be and now it's time to take a look at red and blue Giovanni and I kind of rely on fire blast a lot here it's just kind of it's just too strong the fact of the matter here is that you'll likely need to heal after this fight to get some PP back anyway so I just use the, the fastest most efficient path through the battle and at the end of the day it's just another red and blue Giovanni fight and I think we can move on before rival number six I do teach mimic here and it's very key for this fight I talk about this a good bit and just like last time, Fire Blast is going to make the Pidgeot trivial, and Rhyhorn is Rhyhorn unless you're doing a Voltorb run. And if you're ever having any trouble on this fight, just make sure you get your experience in a good range to where you won't level up, and when the Growlithe comes in, it's kind of your savior. You can just mimic agility. You can do it three times. If you need the speed, it's great. If you don't, it does give you three badge boosts. It's alright. We take it out, and that just allows you, it gives you that little extra punch just to ensure that the Alakazam and the Blastoise are just a little bit easier to take down. On the Blast Toys, I do lead with a Body Slam because there's just a really high likelihood that it's going to use Withdraw anyway, so I just get the most use out of it. And after that, I go straight Fire Blast. I hope it doesn't hit a Hydro Pump, and that's pretty much the battle. Now when that's done, I personally clutch something else, and it has nothing to do with Ninetales. If you watch my streams, you'll know that I often forget the HM for strength, especially if I get an earlier Surf user, and after the battle, I just remember in time to not take that significant time loss by not getting it. Now moving ahead, like with a lot of Gyarados weak runs, the training is not done, but like I detailed earlier, I was able to streamline this process after a lot of refining, so I don't have 
have to do every single battle here. There's seven total battles and they're just mostly on the straight path. They don't require too much extra time. And there's particularly juicy wins like the Chansey Cool Trainer and the Cool Trainer at the end that has all those grass types. Now this experience was pretty important. I would say it was key. And now I do think we are ready for the Elite Four. On Dugong, you pretty much just hope it doesn't use rest immediately so that you don't waste a fire blast, and obviously that's what it's going to do immediately. Now I do get a crit after it falls asleep, that kind of makes up for it, and we can move on. Cloyster, there's not much to say, it's neutral to fire damage, it has pretty weak special, we take it out in a single hit. Now Slowbro has Amnesia here, and it just kind of makes the end of the fight a little easier, so I take it, I set up twice, and then I start to really chip down the Slowbro. Now I'm worried that I'll start missing fire blast, so I start to go body slam it's a little bit slower but overall it's just slow and steady we get through the fight and the jinx it was never really in question i was really just worried about a hydro pump from lapras so i wanted to make sure i had an extra special just to be tanky and just to take it out a little faster and overall it does get a little bit dicey we just start to miss a ton of moves on each other but i did hit the first one i got a burn proc and the burn eventually takes it out on its own and that's the first elite four member down as for bruno it's straight fire blast no need for anything fancy. The only thing I'll say this week is that I can't recall a time in my memory where a non-super effective move knocked out the Machamp in one shot. It's just kind of like deceptively tanky. It always survives hits. It's just a shame that Bruno has bad AI and Machamp's moves are just kind of trash. If it had coverage moves, it would actually be kind of scary like it is in Generation 2, but let's just move on. Next up is Agatha, and when you're looking, when you're penciling this fight down, it looks pretty simple. And when you start out the fight, you outspeed the first Gengar, you dig underground, and that's it. This fight's over, right? But then the Golbat comes in. I missed the first Fire Blast, and it uses Haze. Now what you guys need to know about Haze or Mist is that it knocks off your badge boost. Not the extra glitch that we use all the time, your actual badge boost that you're supposed to have. So that means that it can survive a Fire Blast, and it can get off a Confuse Ray. And this is kind of like where the bad luck starts to come in. I hurt myself twice. I'm really close to the red health. Things are looking pretty dire, but luckily I do snap out of the confusion and even without the attack badge boost, I'm able to knock out the haunter. With the haze debuff, I can't knock out the Arbok, but luckily it just goes for a failed screech and I do still outspeed the final Gengar, which is great because I dig underground. It misses the nightshade and once again, I clutch another victory with a critical hit and my friends Ninetales it's still at zero resets. Now my friends, it's time for Gyarados. Now until this last run, I was going into this fight at level 73, I was buying all calciums, and I was going straight fire blast for this fight, and then I discovered a brand new strategy that allowed me to cut out tens of thousands of experience. You seen me earlier in the video buy proteins, and here I saved all of my rare candies, that's gonna take me all the way up to level 70, and here's where the real optimizations came in, and here's where I make a pretty hard pivot to some new moves. First up is Double Edge. The 15 base power increase over Body Slam, it made all the difference in the world. And today I'm going to be learning Reflect over Dig because it's all but useless at this point. And now there's nothing left to do other than to see if Ninetales can defy the odds or if it's going to fall victim like so many Pokemon before it. And here we get to see the idea of the fight. Double Edge at this level, we have around a 94% chance to two-shot it. And you can see here that we can fairly easily tank a Hydro Pump. And I take it out, and things are kind of going how I drew them up. Dragonair comes in, I set up Reflect, and I'm gearing up to clutch yet another win. But guys, Lance, he has other plans. He crits with a Hyper Beam, and that hands us our very first loss of the run. And if we're trying to stay positive here, at least it wasn't by the hands of Gyarados. On the second attempt, the stars align, and I crit, but Gyarados, it's not that easy to get rid of. It survives, it gets a hyper potion, and now we're just back at square one. I crit yet a second time, but it's still not enough. I get a lower roll, and Arceus, he blesses us. It gets a hydro pump miss, and that means that I'm really healthy going into the rest of this fight. Just like last time, Reflect, it allows you to be tanky enough to survive whatever damage, but a Dragon Rage isn't what you want to see. At this 
point, I'm going for the YOLO strats. I'm going to mimic agility and I'm going to fully set up. And while I do take hardly any damage from Hyper Beam, the Dragon Rage still took us kind of low. Now Double Edge, it would be great here, but I just simply can't afford the recoil damage, so I'm forced to go with the 85% Fire Blast, so I start to roll the dice. Now with the agility boost, I can one shot everything, but the Dragonite, it's still fairly scary. Now here, I let loose one more Fire Blast. It does around half. It goes for a Hyper Beam, but I have Reflect and three agility boost on us, so it doesn't do much. And with the battle on the line, I can land a finishing double edge to ensure the victory. And we'll talk about my excitement later. But needless to say, even though I got a little unlucky, one reset on Lance with a fire type that doesn't have much coverage is superb. Finally up is the champion, and there's really nothing left to do but just dive in and see if we can finish this run strong. First up is Pidgeot. There's nothing extra. There's no setup here. It's straight Fire Blast. We can immediately move on in the fight. Now here on the Alakazam, it's basically kind of like a read option here. You mimic Psychic, and depending on what it does, you might have to shift your strategy. The worst case scenario here would be a Psychic special drop. And Reflect, it's not too great either, but here we get neither of those, and a double edge can move us on. Next up is Rhydon, and for safety, I'm just gonna set up Reflect. And I actually get kind of blessed here with two defense drops to boost our stats even further. And with the badge boost, I wasn't even planning on this. It just makes what was already kind of a comfortable fight even better. And from there, we're pretty much invincible with Reflect setup. Psychic, it allows us to pretty easily get past the Arcanine. And I don't even need to tell you guys what Fire Blast is going to do to an Executor. It's not pretty. Maybe avert your eyes. And at the end, it's Blastoise. And I start out by doing the correct play. I toss out a Psychic. It does about half. When it goes for just the withdrawal, I end the run in the only way that I know how. That's with some maximum disrespect with one more huge fire blast bang and that ends the run. And that's it. Ninetales has done it. With a time of 2 hours and 50 minutes even and only one reset, that's nothing to sneeze at. Now I'm really impressed with this Pokemon. As we crown the new champion, I just kind of have to take a look back and reflect on the run a little bit. Now there have been a lot of runs that were kind of surprising to me, whether it be in terms of getting a fast time or just having a perfect run. But given everything that was surrounding Ninetales and kind of how I perceived the run going at first, this one might have surprised me the most out of any run I've ever done. Its learn set is limited, it doesn't have a great way to deal with Gyarados, it's missing the moves that made the Vulpix run possible, and yet somehow, here we stand with a sub 3 hour time with a nearly perfect run. This one was really fun to optimize at first. I thought this one was going to be a 4 hour run when I did my first blind run, then I started to refine it and we got down to about 3 hours 30 minutes, and then I started testing out Double Edge, and that allowed me to cut out about 20 or so extra battles and that made this one feel really well put together and honestly I'd be shocked if anyone could do a better Ninetales run than this but you are more than welcome to try. As for the tier list I think this one is pretty easy in terms of consistency it's pretty much right up there with the very best but it's final time it's just a little bit too high to be put over things like Kangaskhan and Slowpoke but it's very clear that this run is better than Rhydon. Now I know I don't have any of the recent streams up here but one day maybe we'll live in a timeline where the streams and the videos sync up, but that's not really important at the moment. The last thing I'm going to say here is that the A tier, it's kind of getting crowded, so there's a high likelihood that sometime, maybe I've already done it in the past, maybe I'll change the range on that, but since we haven't done every run yet, it's kind of hard to really judge. Maybe we get a B plus tier for things that are around the 2 hour, 40, 45 minute mark, and that might be in order, but I'm not going to think about it right now. As for me, I think that's about it. Once again, special shout out to my channel members. I really appreciate the support you provide and if you want to become one just sign up on the page And if you made it this far and you're not subscribed and you like solo run content You probably should do that now I really need people like you that watch this far into the video and it would help pretty much more than anything But that's about all I have for you guys. I'll see you on the next one. Bye